I'm professional angler Mike Iaconelli, and I'm going to places not known for great fishing, big cities. I fish under trains, inside drainage ditches, near refineries, and airports. Locals don't even think I'll catch anything. Honey, I didn't even know there was bass fishing in really? Central Park. Really? But I know there's great fishing in cities across the country, including this one. Fish number three. This is City Limits Fishing, Philadelphia. This fish is kicking my butt. That is awesome. We sent a champion angler to some great cities on a mission. Philadelphia! That's Washington, D.C. A stone throw away. Chicago River within the city limits. And that's my limit! This is City Limits Fishing. The city of brotherly love is home to Ben Franklin, the founding of America, an underdog fighter who made these stairs famous, and me. This is where I was born. This is my hometown. I grew up here. I learned how to fish here. When you think of Philadelphia, what do you think about? You think about it, you think cheese sticks. And when you think cheese sticks, you gotta think Geno's. The city's also known for great fishing. Fishing? Fishing in Philadelphia. Oh no. Well, maybe not, but it should be. I really wanted to come here to expose what an amazing fishery we have here. I basically learned how to fish as a kid in these waterways. My challenge is to catch a limited bass in six hours within the city limits of Philadelphia. We launch on the Jersey side of the Delaware River, not far from where I grew up in Runnymede, a suburban area a few miles from Philly. And, and people find out that I'm, I'm from New Jersey, right outside of Philadelphia, and they say, you know, what the heck, what, you know, what kind of fishing's around there? How'd you learn how to fish? And I gotta tell you that the Delaware River, it's one of the best fisheries you can imagine. I head to the shipyards. This is an area with heavy industry, and great structure. The clock is counting down as I make my first cast. When you look at this place, it's industrial seawall pilings. Doesn't look fishy at all. But in a place like this, you can almost predict where you're gonna catch the fish. This long wall is uniform, except for a lone pipe. It's the type of structure which fish relate to. Made the first pass with a lure called a scrounger head. It's a lure that covers water, stays high in the water column. Didn't get a bite. Made the second pass down with a crankbait, something that goes in the middle of the zone. On the third pass, I pick up a spinning rod with a little tiny worm on it. Good one. Good one. Good one. Good one. Oh, God. I get it about halfway to the boat, and whoosh, fish gets off. That wasn't supposed to happen. <laughs> that wasn't supposed to happen. Oh. Uh. See, that's the ultimate, like, in your face. You lose a fish, he jumps off, and then he leaves you with a tangle. You know, one of the worst things you could do, and I had a tendency to do this in my, my younger years, is get too frustrated and mad. You know, I immediately fixed the worm, threw back in that same exact spot. Last time a plane went past, I got a bite. Let's see, maybe it'll turn him on. All right, here's the first keeper of the day. That's, that's a lot smaller than that last one I just lost. But I tell you, it's, it's, it's a start. Finally, first thing in the morning, my first keeper of the day. Look at my watch, though, the, talk, the clock's ticking, so I gotta keep going. We leave the Delaware River and head north into the Schuylkill River. This is an industrial part of town with a lot of refineries and manufacturing. And a lot of these places we fish aren't necessarily beautiful by the eye, but what's below in the water is amazing. Same cover, same fish, same fishing opportunities. So you've got to go in there with an open mind. I'm still trying to figure out the puzzle, so I find cover similar to the wall where I got the first two bites. But there's a barge next to it. I squeeze through anyway. And I basically try to do the same thing I did on the first spot, fish it top to bottom. So after fishing it all the way through on top, I fish it again with the worm. On the other side is some open water, an old tugboat, and some gnarly cover, but no fish. On the way out, I cast my crankbait alongside of the barge. There's a good one, big one, big one. Oh God. God! No! 
I, mean, I got to tell you, at this point, I'm really starting to get frustrated. I mean, that's the second good fish I lost in the morning. The clock's ticking. I'm feeling the pressure. I run back to the Delaware River and the Interstate 95 bridge to a point I spotted on my graph. This was kind of an instinctive move. Never fished a place in my life, but it looked interesting. It, it, it looked like a place that would have fish. Yeah, you know, I'm always watching my graph. One, one of the things the fish always relate to is depth changes. We were in about 15 to 20 foot of water the whole time. And all of a sudden, I started getting some grass on the crankbait and looked down, and it's only about seven, eight foot. So it's always good to look at your graph and look for those points. This point is on the main channel and will be affected by the tides. The Schuylkill River drains into the Delaware River, which drains into the Delaware Bay and to the Atlantic Ocean. As a result, tides affect where the fish stage. I'm trying to learn where the fish are at in this tide. They're definitely pushed back further than they normally are. With the constant pressure of the clock and bites few and far between, I do what a lot of anglers do. You automatically want to start fishing faster. You, you kind of kick into overdrive, and that's what's happening to me. The day's progressing, I'm thinking, I gotta keep covering water, I gotta keep covering water. Again, you're looking for bites. When you don't get a bite, you're not getting pieces of the puzzle, you're not getting a sign. Picked up my crankbait, and immediately, probably second or third cast in, there he goes, the hook up, land it, boom, my second keeper of the day. Pretty good feeling, and now I'm starting to get a little bit more dialed that these fish are a little bit off of the bottom. I pull out the hook, put the fish in a live well, and head to the front of the boat. The tide is changing on me, and I need to catch as many fish as possible before the current dies. You always want moving water. You want current. I keep chunking and whining, but I don't get any bites. The tide has turned on me. So all of a sudden, we look at the, we look at the tide, and it's basically stopped. It's non-existent, no current. That's a bad time to fish. So it's almost a waiting game for the tide to start coming back in. Would you ever think about fishing out there for fun? No. On a day off? No. Relaxation? No. What about competition? What no. about $100,000 for the five biggest bass you can catch? Would you do it? No, ain't no bass out there. I'm trying to catch a limited bass on the Delaware and Schuylkill Rivers in Philadelphia. I grew up here and learned to fish on these waters, but today, I'm struggling. To be honest with you, I'm pretty disappointed. I've had four bites today. I've caught two and lost two, and, and of course, the two that I lost were, were better than average fish, so I'm a little behind schedule. It's dead low tide, and the water isn't moving. Instead of waiting for the tide to turn, I run and gun, looking for places where there's some current. I also want to gain advantage of this low water, so I want to try to cover as much of the low water as I can. I run past the refineries, smokestacks, and storage tanks, but I stop along a bank with a drainage pipe where the water is moving just a little bit. This is a pipe where water comes in and out depending on the tides, so the fish are always going to be a little more attracted to an area like this because it's a funnel. The food's being brought to them, so these are always good to fish, fish pipes and drains and anywhere that a little bit of current will be funneled into it. Because the tide is low, the bank is exposed where I can see the vegetation and structure. But in the murky water, I can also see some really small minnows. Instantly, I jump down in the boat, open up my hatch, start going through my boxes and boxes of crankbaits, trying to find something that looks exactly like the minnows I just saw. I find a crankbait that's the perfect size, the perfect color. I tie that thing on, and I go back down the same bank I had just fished. Instantly, I mean within casts, I got another hookup. There it goes, rods bent over, reel that thing in. Boom, third fish of the day. I gotta tell you, even though the third fish of the day wasn't the biggest, for me that was a turning point. My pace picked back up, my attitude got better, and I felt like I was on a track to catching my five fish limit. It's real important to pay attention to what the fish are eating. Always try to match the size and the color of the bait fish. That's supposed to be a minnow. There's my keeper, and he ate it. 
Number three, baby, right in the boat. Now I start getting dialed in. I have another piece of the puzzle. I realize that the fish are up off the bottom. They're not relating to the bottom. They're, they're above. They're in that middle zone. I make another couple of passes without a bite, so I leave. I'm looking for vertical cover, and I find it at the next bridge. You can present a bait that runs straight down that piling, straight down that middle zone, so it was like a connection going on. I fish it for 15 minutes without a bite. I'm running and gunning, and I'm under the gun. I'd like to have more fish than I have now on the boat, but you just got to keep fishing. You got to keep going. Sometimes it'll happen like that. You just never know when it's going to happen. I find a concrete wall similar to where I got my first bites earlier in the day. But there's nothing happening, and I'm getting frustrated. Tide's starting to come back in. It's rolling in, but uh, you expect these fish to be turning on a little bit with some more water movement. It's still tough to trigger a bite. The higher the water was getting, the worse the fishing was getting. So we didn't want that high water. On top of that, we had a bluebird day. No clouds in the sky, very still and crisp. And all of a sudden, every once in a while, you get these little bursts of wind. So this is something that's, that definitely makes you a little excited. It's changing the conditions. You know, basically the fish feed better when it's windy because they can't get a good look at the bait. So it breaks up the surface and, and they, see the fi they see the bait and they think it's real. We run upriver near the skyscrapers of Center City, Philadelphia. I find a tree covered bank, blowing wind and pilings in the water. There's history on these rivers, and, and these pilings are some old industry that used to be here. But it provides something different for these fish. It provides an ambush point. I'm really starting to feel the pressure. I, I want to pick it up. I want to pick up the pace. I want to keep covering water. Big one. Big one. Go, big one. Go, stay buttoned. Stay, he's barely out. He's barely out. Oh, God. Oh. Oh. Once he's in the boat, that fish is mine. I'm not losing him. <laughs> Safe at home. Bumble, recovery. Number four, baby. Philadelphia. Right there. Right there. Philadelphia. Woo! Yeah! When you think about fishing in Philadelphia, what do you think about? Fishing in Philadelphia. What do you want to get? This first time I heard that one. Finally getting dialed in the fish on my home waters in Philadelphia. Number four, good solid fish. I've got four fish in a boat, just one short of my limit. I'm really starting to feel the pressure. I, I want to pick it up. I want to pick up the pace. I want to keep covering water. I'm looking for my fifth bite. I'm looking for a big bite. I'm now changing my approach, just like I would in a tournament. I don't need numbers anymore. I need size. I need a kicker fish. I'm looking for areas like current funnels, isolated areas of cover. I'm looking for something that's going to have a big fish. I know I need one more, but the clock's ticking. I find a bank with overhanging vegetation with trees. There are trains going by, and the Philadelphia skyline is in the background. One thing we've hardly seen any of is other boats. Millions of people live in this large metropolitan city, but I'm fishing water that gets little to no pressure. People don't realize the potential of these urban fisheries. You know, they see the skyscrapers, they think about the city, and they see this river passing through the middle, and they think, hey, you know what, there can't be nothing alive in there. It's gotta be just trash and muddy, dirty water. And they're wrong. I move the boat tight to the overhanging limbs and crouch down. I cast as deep into the cover as I can. And I'm looking almost through the trees, and I notice this giant pipe, this huge culvert pipe. And automatically, what goes through my mind is, that's the kind of place that's going to have a big fish. I move around the tree limbs, and I look deep into the culvert. I can see some current. The water is moving. Any kind of pipe that's going to have some kind of current moving through it, that's exactly the kind of place that a big fish is going to set up. I pick up a seven-foot casting rod and throw the scrounger into the giant pipe. But I miss my target by a foot or so. When you see a spot like that, and it's so perfect, but yet there's all these obstacles. 
You're trying to get in, you're trying to get under, you're breaking branches. This is another part of urban fishing that to me is exciting, you know. I reposition the boat and cast in again. You've really got to think about the angles. That's an important part of casting, an important part of fishing, is you've got to think about what's the perfect angle, not only to get a lure up into that pipe, but to bring it back at the perfect spot. I carefully use my trolling motor and move around the tree limbs and in a little bit tighter. So I'm working up to the spot. I'm trying to get that perfect angle. I throw in there once. I, I miss a little bit to the left. I throw in again. I miss to the right. I get positioned at the correct angle and make another cast. My time's slipping away, so my heart's pounding. I know that if I can make this right cast, here's my shot at number five, and a big number five. The bait lands in the middle of the pipe. The lure lands exactly where I want it to land, and I'm slow rolling that bait. And as I'm reeling it, all of a sudden, oh God, giant, giant smallmouth. I'm worried about getting them caught in these limbs. There's branches everywhere. Go, giant smallmouth. It's a giant smallmouth. I giant fight him to the left, fight him to the right. Boom, swing him in the boat. God, it's the one of you. Ah! 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 Echo. Echo. Echo, Echo. I just caught number five. It's a giant, it's a three pound plus smallmouth. Uh, there's nothing better that could have happened at that point during the day. Look at the watch. We're getting down on time. We had four fish. We kept fishing, we kept fishing, we kept hunting. We get to an area that typifies urban fishing. A sewer pipe, of all things, in downtown Philadelphia. Doesn't matter what kind of cover it is. The concrete, the current, the bass, matching the forage, matching the small shad that are out there. And that's the kind of results. Don't be scared of urban fisheries. You can catch giants. Yeah! Woo! There isn't any. There's no bass. I'm tell me, tell me what you think of when you think of the water and the schuylkill. I'm actually the wrong person to ask because I'm a plumber. And I know how the city recycles the water. This is Mike. Check out my book, Fishing on the Edge, and you'll learn why I never give up. For more information on clothing, gear, and equipment used on the show, go to MikeIconelli.com. I'm fishing for bass in Philadelphia. The pressure's off because I have my limit and a nice three-pound smallmouth kicker. I'm getting close to downtown Philadelphia, and I'm stopping at bridges along the way. Yeah, I'm fishing around these bridge ponds. I'm looking for a giant bite. I throw over there with the bait. I feel a hit, I miss it. Immediately throw back. Got him. Catch the fish, it's a short smallmouth. I don't know, he ain't gonna help the keeper, but I don't think he's gonna come. Anytime you get a bite, anytime you get a sign or, or a little bit of a hit, throw back in that area. Nine times out of 10, the fish is gonna come back and hit it again. But we're still after a bigger fish. I'm gonna put this one back and we're gonna keep fishing. If I can get it out of my pants. This area is alive. A huge ball of bait fish is on the grass and I get another strike. So I set this hook, all of a sudden I got this big fish on. I think it's another giant bass. It ends up being a catfish. Okay, no big deal. Land a catfish, throw him back. Yuck. In all the excitement, I ended up kicking one of my rods and reels in the water, like a thousand dollar combo. Almost gets away from me. Snatch that thing back. I don't get any more bites before time runs out and I release my catch. I gotta tell you, today was a struggle. It was a tough day. I got about seven bites all day, but I only managed to land five. But that's the kind of fish you wanna catch for your number five. People are always amazed when I tell them I grew up fishing near Philadelphia. But a lot of cities have parks along the water that are accessible. Shane Noble is a very cool kid I met fishing at Fairmont Park. He said, want to try? And handed me the rod. Then stood by to offer his assistance. They've been hitting it pretty good? He asked me, a total stranger, to watch his tackle so we can run home and get another rod so we can fish All together. All right, let's do it. All right, All right, cool. I put a fresh worm on the bobber and continued to fish until Shane eventually returned with the other rod. Now we can fish together. Did you just around here? Yeah, I did. Oh, I got one. 
good bass too. Harry, you want to hold it? Grab him right by the lip. You ready to let that thing go? Yep. All Shane right, throws it back. back, and I tie on another bait. What's the best bait? You know, it, there's a lot of good baits. A little plastic worm, a little plastic grub, small hook, just reel it straight in. So you don't have to use live bait all the time? Oh, no. You don't have to use live bait all the time. All right. I'll bet you we'll catch one on one of these artificials. If you're using live bait, the turtles will say it and no one it. They turtles have a problem. Really? Yep. Painter turtles? Painted snapper. Snapper turtles? Yep. He likes the buzz bait, so I show him how to use it. All right, here's the deal with this thing. Long cast, right? As soon as it hits the water, start reeling. So don't, don't let it sink. And then you reel, and then every once in a while, just kick it to make it spit. Want to try it? Want to try it with this one? Sure. All right. Shane never asked my name or what I did for a living. I'll swap with you. Here, give me that one. He never knew I won the Bassmaster Classic. Swap. I was just some guy he met at the park by his house who shared his love of fishing. By the way, our only fish was caught on one of Shane's worms. So if you want advice for fishing in Philadelphia, don't ask me, ask Shane. It's one of the best spots to fish down here. Right above the frogs, the bass, swim around, striper swim by, sometimes the shag, there's carp. Best fishing around here.